morning to everyone, uh, especially those of you who are joining us on Zoom as well. Uh, it's our great pleasure to be sharing with you a little bit of our project, uh, which is focusing on digital literacy and digital fluencies at higher education institutions in South Africa. In particular, we're looking at the three institutions which we represent, so myself, um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Dr. Upasana Singh from the School of Me uh, here at Westfall Campus. So representing the UK Zedian um, perspective of digital fluencies and digital capital. Here I have with me Professor Grace from the University of Johannesburg. And lastly, uh, Dr. Leo Evans from, from Uni Zulu, who is no stranger to UK Zedian. He's done, mm -hmm. I think, two workshops for us um, pre-COVID. Uh, as part of our Atal project. So, to start off with, I just want to introduce my colleagues to you. Dr. Evans is from UNIZULU and is a senior lecturer and the head of Department uh, of Information Studies at the University of Sudanet. I'm not going to read out his bio, but I want to just share with you um, who he is to us in this team. So, the three of us are Tau Tau Fellows. Um, teaching advancement in universities. For those of you who are passionate about teaching and learning, I'm sure you would have heard of the TAL program. And we were together in the second batch of TAL, and we were in a group which was called, eventually called ETAL. Um, and he's going to explain to you a little bit about our project, and that's where the, the in, the um, momentum for the current project in digital literacy started from. Um, Neil has a, a great understanding of pedagogy, blended learning, um, and the implementation of e-learning technologies, and he brings a lot to our team in terms of the pedagogical aspects of um, you know, being able to offer online teaching in, a, in better ways and methods. Then I have uh, the third member of the team who is Professor Grace. Grace has been the live wire in our TAL project and she is the live wire in our current project for NRF. So if ever you want to find, uh, if ever you want to de-stress and have a joke or if you want to have somebody who's ever willing to assist you in your projects, Grace is the person who always steps in um, and she keeps us all together and keeps us alive when we're feeling very joined. So Grace is uh, an associate professor at the University of Johannesburg in the Academy of Computer Science and Engineering. Um, she has a great speciality in artificial intelligence and she uses this to apply to her passion for education and for teaching and learning. So uh, she's going to be sharing with us a little bit about the conceptual side of our, our project um, and the implementation of it. I'm going to invite Neil to the podium now, and Neil is going to uh, give you a bit of background with regards to our project which we completed for TAL, and he's going to introduce this current project through that poster. So... Thanks so much, Sanbonani. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Singh, Asana, for the introduction, for being kind. And um, thanks for the invitation from UKZN again. It's good to see you guys. Um, teaching Advancement at Universities Project, a very fruitful project uh, where we networked with, networked with uh, all the universities of South Africa and got into groups according to our interests. And as Upasana said, uh, the ETAL group uh, originated from a group of us, um, the names are up there, and forgive me, I didn't pack my, my glasses, so uh, I'll just have to go through this uh, from the screen. I normally zoom this poster up on the, on, the, on the laptop, so forgive me if I can't read the names, but it was Bassi, it was DUT, it was, help me out with this one, Pradesh from DUT, and also a couple of other people that you can see on the screen there. But um, after the project, the three of us uh, discussed uh, initiating an NRF project. Uh, Upusana initiated it and asked us to join. 
And from that, we use this as a conceptual framework for our NRF project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to can I step away and, and point back at the screen? All right, so you won't see me in the camera, I'll be in the front here. Um, but let's go through the poster. Okay, so I'll try to angle myself a little bit so I can also see. Um, we'll go through the poster, which as I said, um, basically looks at how technology can assist learning in higher education. And it starts on the left hand side by the program development. So when we develop our cur curriculum, these are the aspects that we need to consider at the micro, meso, and macro levels. Obviously, the, the programs that you, you develop have an exit level outcome. And that exit level outcome includes the 21st century graduate attributes, which is ICT and communication skills. So the purpose of the program um, needs stakeholder involvement. So if we are developing programs for industry or the private public sectors, uh, we need to know what the requirements are for our programs and we need to um, revise our, our, our curriculums to accommodate the 21st century uh, requirements, information literacies and graduate attributes. So let's start at the micro level. At the micro level, we've obviously got a program that has modules, and those modules will have study units. And the study units obviously have a learning outcome. What we're saying is that these study units should be a combination of these eight learning events. So the eight learning events is typically not just spoon feeding our students with content and expecting them to regurgitate it, but it's, it includes the, the exploring, the creating, the debating, the practicing. Um, so a variety of, of learning events that many of them can't be easily or practically achieved without digital tools and literacies and fluencies. So at the bottom here, we recommend that when we design the study units um, on the LMS or wherever we're hosting, uh, we, we take this into account that it must be a variety of learning events that will suit the diversity of learning styles in our classroom. The very important thing in the middle here is the meta learning. So what is meta learning? Any, anyone with an idea about meta learning? So metadata is information about information. Meta learning is sitting down after the lecture and say, saying, what have I learned and how can I apply it in my context? So the call to Africanize the curriculum um, and to decolonize the, the curriculum or whatever you want to call it requires us to, to not only teach theories or practices that are, are, are foreign to our students. We need them to be able to sit down after a, a learning event and say, yes, I've learned something constructive and I can apply this knowledge in my community to solve problems and um, make progress. The, the circle around here is obviously the, where the title of the abstract comes from, practice how we preach. So it's, it's, it's a matter of um, reflecting after the process, after our, our semester, and um, modifying if we need to. And that often comes from student feedback. All right, so at the MISO level, the modules, what we're saying is that um, the lecturers responsible for the modules should not only have content knowledge, which we all do have, because we've specialized in our discipline, but we should also have um, some qualifications in teaching, so, or have attended some uh, course that will give us some pedagogical knowledge. 
So how do you deliver the content to your students? Um, from my experience, social constructivism includes debating, agreeing to disagree or agreeing to agree. And in social constructivism, the majority will have the, the say at the end of the day. So when we come to knowledge and, and relativism, uh, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for you. And the majority need to decide what works for them in the class. So content, pedagogy, and technological knowledge. So these days we need the digital currencies and that's where the project originated um, to deliver the content. During COVID we were forced to deliver the content online. Uh, today's Student Strike is another perfect example of how we can use that methodology in, in uh, crisis situations like what we experience at UniZulu and UKZN on a semester basis. It's just a matter of time until the crisis happens. Um, and it, 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 the crisis normally evolves from this, but I'll get to that just now. So at the module level, we're saying TPAC is, in, is, is necessary, and as lecturers, we need to reflect on our, on our knowledge and uh, understand that the technology is changing all the time. Uh, pedagogies haven't changed that much over the years, but um, I'm sure we can develop new pedagogies that will better suit the students of the 21st century. At the program level, as I said, the exit level outcome requires 21st century information literacies. And reading and writing of the past and library instruction, if you could read and write and you could use the library, you were considered information literate in the past. Today, that's not true. Today, we need the computer literacies, we need the network literacies, we need the media literacies. So a lot of our students are audio visual learners. Um, so putting a picture talks a thousand words in many cases. And very importantly is the cultural currency. As I said earlier, um, to Africanize and to solve African problems in Africa, it's no use teaching Western philosophies and, and theories without showing students how to apply it and how we can apply it in a local context. And uh, sometimes adapting the curriculum if those theories don't suit that local context. All right, the connectivism is the blended learning model that we adopted. Um, so connectivism is, is seeing learning and higher education as in ecology. So those of you in life sciences know that ecology is a living system. It's a living, breathing system. And for us to teach and for our students to learn, that ecology has to be healthy. When it's not healthy, the intent and the change in our students doesn't occur. The intent to learn and the change does not occur. So making sure that our students are comfortable, um, financially supported, um, well fed, safe. It's a big issue at Unizulu. A lot of students stay off campus, and uh, even walking back home at night is a is a trauma for many of them after they've been robbed of their laptops. Um, I experienced the same issue in Ontario. My uh, laptop was robbed. Uh, much of my work was taken. And um, I can just imagine what students feel like on a daily basis having to go through that trauma. So at the middle, we've got the face-to-face. -face. You can see that is in black. So during COVID, we did not rely on face-to-face -face at all. But for social constructivism to work effectively, we need to have face-to-face -face constructions, uh, constructing and uh, debating and agreeing and disagreeing and being vocal in class, being able to express ourselves. Because let's face it, who you are online is completely different to who you are offline. So in the real world, you need to debate in real life. 
you can't hide it, hide it, add it to online and, and, and then throw your opinions across. So, e-learning, very important to blend with face-to-face. -face. Informal and self-learning is the intent to learn. So without an intent that informal and, and self-learning doesn't occur and it becomes regurgitation, uh, reproducing information uh, in the exams. One of the best ways of learning is research. And that's what we're doing. We're researching the topic and we're learning from that research and we're trying to improve our own teaching and, and learning methods in our own classrooms. And hopefully sharing it with, with colleagues who, who can apply it. Community outreach is vital. Um, work integrated learning is vital. So in many of the professional programs, um, it's a, it's a compulsory component to have work integrated learning. But I encourage all programs to get involved with stakeholders in the industry and whoever is absorbing your students needs to give them the opportunity to have practical experience about what needs to be learned for the workplace. That motivates them in the ecology and it gives them a, a, a fresh insight on what needs to be done in terms of the meta-learning. How do I apply this knowledge in the workplace, in my community, to solve their problems and to, to, to make a living? To empower themselves and to empower the communities. All right, so I won't go through this. Uh, the conjugates of knowledge, um, or information, should I say, when there are language barriers, and many of our students do uh, encounter these language barriers, uh, where English is not a first language, and I, I, I propose that we bring back the indigenous languages into higher education, because if you ask me to critically engage with the UNIC I wouldn't do it. So no worries, I could be polite, but that's all I could do. And that's what our students are doing in class. They're being polite, but when you ask them the critical questions, uh, there's no answer coming from them. It's not because they don't want to engage, it's because they can't express themselves. So, um, becoming fluent in a, in a indigenous language for lecturers is, is one of the things that we'll have to work on. Reflect and change, eventually for higher education to be truly successful. But what I'm saying is that uh, when there is language barriers, um, technology can assist us. Um, are you guys familiar with the South African language? Saitula, digital resources uh, project. So they've just brought out a spelling checker for the, all the indigenous languages. So you can install it into MS Word and students can uh, check their spelling in their own uh, languages. And I can also write in this if and check my spelling, which is great. So I can add motivational things in my, in my learning, um, in my module and my learning outcomes here that will motivate them to engage. All right, um, this ecology, as I say, has to be healthy. And if it's not healthy, the intent and the change is minimal, uh, which is essentially producing students that are unemployable. Yes, I've got degrees because we don't want to see them next year in our class again. We've really got new intakes. So they get the 50%, they get the degree, but uh, the change and the, the transformation doesn't occur. All right, to, to to end off, we'll look at the challenges of implementing uh, technology in our classrooms and the trends. So, I hope I can remember these things with my heart because I can't see it from here. But as a Tao project, we, sorry, we decided that we should not concentrate on wicked problems. Um, we should concentrate on solvable challenges. And as a first step, whenever you're initiating something, that is what I advise we do. 
don't jump in at the deep end and, and fail. Rather start somewhere where you can have a positive impact and move it up from there. So what we said is that um, if we look at our capitals, um, having social capital gives you a better chance of firstly coming to higher education and secondly succeeding. But in the 21st century, even if you don't have social capital, um, digital capital can assist you. If your language barriers exist, digital capital can assist you. So the whole idea is to provide both students and staff members an opportunity to improve their digital capital and um, hopefully improve the outputs in, in our graduate attributes. Um, the trends in technology, this is quite an old poster, so I attended a, a lecture yesterday at uh, the Cadets in South Coast where DUT gave a lovely presentation on the robots and air drones and um, the artificial intelligence in the post-industrial revolution. It was, um, it was very uh, impactful, but practical, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of money invested in a lot of tools that um, you can include for gamification. So gamification is a very good method to include fun activities in, in, in the learning events. Um, but other than that, it's, 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 it's something that we need to work on. How can artificial intelligence determine the, the point of your learning? And we know students learn in different uh, speeds, uh, different IQs. So how can artificial intelligence pick up where you are and what do you need to progress to the outcome that we want to achieve in the, in the module and in the program? Uh, which is something that we'll look at in the, in the trends. But colleagues, uh, I'm going to end off with the reason why we are doing this. We are doing this for our students to learn. Um, how many of you guys, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a culprit here, you know, when I did my BSc, we had textbooks like this. And then in the timetable, they put the the, the, the physics exam and biochemistry exam on one day. One in the morning, one in the afternoon. Yeah. And, hey, I can feel for our students, you know, how can we not pick up these risks in, in our town table? So we, we reproduced, we learned off by heart. We, we, we looked at the exam papers, right? We saw what the lecturer gave last year, we saw what he gave the year before, we saw what he we saw a pattern, right? And it's like gambling. If you see a pattern, you can predict what questions will be in this year's exam. And it was pretty successful. And that's how many of us got through, was that we spotted the questions that we thought would come up. We couldn't learn the whole textbook, but we couldn't learn two textbooks in one day, uh, for one day's exam. So reproducing the information needs to be different. Um, we need to, to reflect on it and um, yeah, change. We need to apply and cross, cross that uh, threshold and seek meaning in the information that we learn. How can we apply this learning? How can we change a problem that we've encountered? How can we empower ourselves to empower the community that we're saying? Then lastly, the conceptions of knowledge, dualism. How many of you guys still give multiple choice questions in your, in your modules? Yes, true, false. That's dualism, right? It's true or it's false. There's nothing in between. Which in higher education is very seldom the case. All right, unless you have a, a play on words and you, you're actually testing your language abilities and not the actual content. So, dualism is, is not recommended. Multiplicity is a way forward, but the threshold is relativism. So, knowledge is relative. What works today won't work tomorrow. 
for works for me might not work for you. And that's where social constructivism comes in, to say we need to socially agree on what is the truth for us. And the truth for you might not be the truth for me. So relativism is the threshold that we need to aspire to for our students. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you. So this was a request to have an end to our episode. Okay, guys, if you want to engage with us on Zoom, uh, please unmute yourselves. Um, the chats might not be as engaging, so please unmute yourselves and uh, engage with us. Uh, you're welcome to do that. But uh, let me look at some of these comments. Um, it was meant to be put on a website. But I think we can send it to all participants. Um, I'll also put it on our website and uh, send it, uh, maybe a link later. But yeah, we can, we can uh, definitely send that and share that. So yes, the presentation will be sent to all attendees. Thank you. All right, any other questions, guys? All right, thank you very much. of the child project, um, I seem to have just skipped a slide in two, uh, and I, I think it's important that I just briefly highlight for you what the purpose of today's workshop is, even though we've already started with it. So as Neil already explained, uh, we, we as academics, we need to evaluate the types of literacies that we have, the types of pedagogies that we know, and the types of technologies that we use for teaching purposes in order to give our students a better experience in the learning process. So the main objective of today's workshop is to explore these digital literacies and fluencies for you. Um, from both the academic side and from the student side, we look at the TPAP model, which uh, Neil is, or I, I should say Neil is probably an expert at that TPAP model. For those of you who attended his previous workshops, uh, you would have benefited from his expertise in this area. And what we're trying to do as part of our NRF project is to develop a framework which can be used by higher education institutions in South Africa to evaluate the digital capital and digital fluency which is present uh, in their uh, institutions. So we're now going to move to Grace. Or should I just do the overview of the project first? Okay. So the current project that we're doing was uh, initiated through this the ETAL project which we had. And in this this particular project, what we're trying to measure here is the amount of digital capital. So that was the first part of the study to measure the amount of digital capital that is present in our three institutions because it's a collaborative project. We try to achieve this by using the, the Bordeaux framework. And in Bordeaux's framework, he speaks about five types of capital. That's social capital, digital capital, economic capital, political capital, and, and the last one. Sorry, I forgot the last one. But there's five types of, of, of capitals which he speaks about. And um, the idea here is to identify whether our students who we are teaching who we regard as digital natives, whether they have the relevant capital to be able to use the technology in their learning process and not just for social purposes. We also want to, to look at or be able to profile the types of uh, people who have the capital existing in there. We also needed to look institutionally 
at what types of digital capital are available. So overall, in, in the institution, therefore, in our project, we're looking at both the academic perspective and the student perspective of capital. And finally, what we're trying to understand is whether if academics and students at that institution have a high level of digital capital and better digital fluency, are they able to make better use of the technology for their teaching purposes or for their learning purposes? So if somebody has high digital capital, does it really benefit them in that entire process of teaching and learning? And the way in which we, we planned to do this project was the first part of the project was the baseline assessment. And I think a number of you sitting here today and a number of you in the virtual audience may have participated in our surveys which we sent out to the academics. And in this survey, we asked a, a series of questions under each section of the capitals to identify the level of um, of, of existence of each of those capitals amongst the academics at our institutions. We had a similar survey which we sent out to students. Um, I think because they were, uh, there was a lot of research which was being conducted at the time when we sent out the surveys and people were suffering from survey fatigue, the, the responses which we received were not as many as we anticipated. Nevertheless, we still use the data, we did the analysis, and we know that we can't take that data and project it on the entire population because it's not representative, but it helped us to get a little bit of a better understanding of the type or the amount of capital which is present in our institutions. Based on that baseline assessment, we then worked together with the developer from the University of Johannesburg on your low, to develop the module which you now see on Moodle uh, at GKZL, which is called e-learning for lectures. It was developed as a MOOC and together with the assistance of the uh, instructional designers who we have at the, the, the UTLO at UKZN, we designed that particular module as a self-paced module as an intervention to try to improve the digital fluency of academics at UKZF. So, uh, assessing what we found in the baseline study, it applied the intervention, following the completion of the MOOC by, we're hoping all academics who have registered for that module, once they've been able to complete it or we have sufficient number of academics who have completed that MOOC, we will then look at ways in which we need to apply further interventions, whether there's more skilling that's required, more workshops that need to be developed, more individual uh, assistance, for example, with instructional design in terms of, of courses and so on. And that will then help us to determine or to, to devise this framework which we're trying to develop as part of the project. So at the end of it all, we're hoping by the time this project is completed, it's a three-year project which is funded by the NRF, and we're currently in the second year, we're hoping by the end of next year we'll be able to come up with this framework for enhancing digital capital at higher education institutions in South Africa. So Grace will then take us through the background studies and the conceptual framework which we developed from the background study. And I hopefully, if we have enough time, we'll, we'll very briefly run through the course which has been developed to give you an idea of what to expect if you haven't already registered for it. And for those of you who have registered for it, to be able to assist you with, it, with any queries which you may have. Thank you. Right, uh, good morning, everyone, again. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about um, this part of our project. Uh, so, the outline of this presentation is just to contextualize our problem, which actually has been done already, uh, but I will just, just pull some nuggets from what we pointed out during the journey of our research, and then I will talk about our uh, conceptual model that we developed in the first year, and then to go through some of the results of our survey, just to give everyone an idea of how we 
Uh, what, what, what interesting things we've discovered based on the feedback we've got from our questionnaire and how that helped us inform uh, the creation of our uh, of the Moodle um, module. Yeah. So, um, as we all know by now, the our, our success rate in this country when it comes to graduating our students is not exactly the best. Um, if you think about the startling statistics, we only have about 27% of students who finish their qualifications on time. And in addition to that, there are actually 50% who do not complete their qualifications at all. Um, just recently, we, we did a survey at the University of Johannesburg with the undergraduate students, and interestingly, just, just to monitor what's been going on with uh, the lockdown and, and so on, I would ask you all this following question, and I think it is because from our survey we picked up that there isn't really much difference between our three institutions. but. Um, there were a number of students, a, a considerable percentage of students who deregistered. They cancelled their studies from the university. What do you think the number one reason for cancelling studies is? And I think many of you would think your, your first thought is it's probably finances, right? But who thinks it's finances? Okay, so two people, three. All right. Um, what, what, what are the reasons do you think you have that, that someone will say, listen, I cannot do these studies any further, I am just going to proceed, um, I'm going to fill in the cancellation form, thank you very much, I am not going to do, finish my degree. And actually, it turned out we all thought it would be finances. But interesting, in the last two years, the reason for students cancelling, the, the reason they cited was actually the workload the workload was far too much. But now if you think about it, in the last two years, what have they been doing? They haven't been sitting face to face with us. They have been accessing this learning online. And that just gave, you know, when I saw that, I thought, ah, you know what? Um, we, we are now choosing to concentrate on digital capital. And I think that's a very telling point here, that we do need to concentrate on the digital literacy aspect, because it seems that that will play a huge role in ensuring that the students remain in our institutions because they, that's one less thing they have to worry about. Okay, that's, um, uh, but we'll go on to that. Now, as I mentioned, uh, our, our institutions are not trying, it's not a lack of trying that they're saying, ah, you know what, um, if, you, if you are going to cancel, so what? Um, you know, my, our, our new incoming uh, VC, Prof. and Penny, said we should be like our insurance salesman. So you know when you phone and you phone and you say, listen, I want to cancel my insurance? They go, hang on, I do not have the authority to cancel. Let me escalate up to my manager and speak to my manager. Uh, you know, let, let you speak to my manager. And they're like, why do you want to cancel? So, so you said we should be like that. And, and it's fine, we're not trying to do that. And then we, we, we are trying to put in effort and we're saying, please, let, let, let's put in the effort to stay as students, you know, please complete your degree, you're almost there. Um, you know, you've done one year, you can do another two years, or another three years, you, you, you are getting there. You know? and, but, but even despite, you know, despite our efforts, it's not happening. You know, our efforts, Interventions are just not good enough to prevent many of our students from falling behind. So, the thing is, during the lockdown, and actually now, and then we think, oh, lockdown is over, it's done, the nightmare is over, it's not. Because what has happened? For the last two years, the students have been sitting in a digital environment. And now we're suddenly asking them to transition back to what we think is the, the normal, they, for them to transition is still a change. That, that whole thing of transitioning to their new teaching and learning environment. You might be thinking, we're going back. For your first years in the class this year, they weren't coming back. They were actually transitioning to university, number one, and number two, transitioning to university in a less digital environment. What do you mean I can't answer my exam online? What is this? I have to sit and I have to take down notes. What? With a pen? Paper in front of me? No. So the potential value 
of digital capital. So, so our, our research project was to look at the potential value, as Kusana has mentioned, uh, during COVID-19. And the idea is really we wanted to explore it and look at the gap, knowledge gap and strategically fill it. Now, earlier, Kusana said, oh, um, or mentioned, she said, you know, there was this fatigue where filling in forms. Now, how many of you, and let's admit it, I'm also, I, I will say I am one of the victims, is how many of us also have fatigue from all that training? All those, oh, you know, you must sign up for this workshop and that workshop and that workshop. How many of us attended many, many workshops and thought, oh, not another workshop, you know? And so the idea is, let's, we, our lecture, our academics and our students have limited time and we need to acknowledge that, we need to recognize that. We need to say, listen, we respect that. We don't want you to sign up for 600 different programs and training workshops and so on. We want to make sure that we only sign up for a few and of those few, let's make it worth your while so that you can benefit from it in a strategic manner. And so the, the main aim of our research was to investigate and compare the digital capital demonstrated in the e-learning initiatives launched by our universities in South Africa, uh, so that it you know, beyond the pandemic, because yes, the lockdown is over, but we've had other issues. You know, there's always going to be new challenges, as Neil has mentioned. There's always going to be new challenges around the corner that's going to make it difficult or challenging for us to deliver our classes in a more traditional manner. So um, our study, we had five specific questions and um, the, so the first few in, in our initial studies, we, we managed to say, okay, uh, our initial um, reading and survey of literature allowed us to come up with answers to the first few questions. And the idea is, uh, for example, number one, what characteristics what characterizes people who have digital capital in terms of widows, different capitals, as uh, the son mentioned that already. Uh, what characterizes people who do not have digital capital at all? Um, and, and the idea there is to just capitalize on who has and who doesn't in order for us to bridge that gap. Now, the other three that we looked at what digital capital exists at the selected uh, ATIs, I will talk about that now. And with the possession of digital capital improve the delivery of education and throughput rates, well, that's what we intend to try and find out. And how to select an HIs foster and support digital capital during and after, again, hopefully by the end of next year, we will have answers for that. Now, this is the conceptual framework that we devised and uh, put together. Uh, this actually comes, we were inspired by uh, three different frameworks in, in developing this. And Neil mentioned earlier, that at the end of the day, your student in your classroom um, also has an offline persona and that they bring that, those characteristics into the online environment. And that's why, despite the fact that we are looking at digital capital, it, it, it would be incorrect or silly of us to think that we, can, we just have to focus on the online aspects of a student. Uh, all, all the academic, and that's why in this example, in this diagram, can you see that we have um, aspects related to an offline, but also aspects related to an online environment. Um, so, um, from, from looking at these, uh, we, we were able to create this 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 um, framework, and from this framework, we then devised the various different questions in our questionnaire that uh, wasn't as well completed, but it, it still gave us a starting point from there to, to come up with some interesting um, elements or, 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 or points that we picked up, which were a bit of a surprise to us when we saw those results, and so I'd like to share some of those with you. Right, so um, these results focus specifically on the academics, and, and the reason why is we, we are now we are working on the Moodle, um, and we're aiming for let's look at the academic first. Now, the age distribution of the participants, um, we, we noticed that it was actually the older academics that were more keen on sharing and completing the information for us. 
Um, and also the academic position, you can see that it is the more senior academics. And I think I'd like to think that when you are working on part-time, which is the new ones that are just stepping in, these are the people who don't really know. They, they just show the institution perhaps, and they're not quite sure, uh, you know, what is their great role in teaching and learning. Whereas uh, I'd like to believe that the, our full professors and associate professors have had many years of thinking, what does it truly mean to teach and produce quality graduates uh, in the classroom? Now, in terms of experience, this actually correlates to what we have. I mean, if the majority of people completing these, this our questionnaire were uh, professors and associate professors, you can see that they do have more than 20 years of experience. Uh, the, the, the one is 6 to 10, um, even 6 to 10 is still not, not, not people who have joined just around the corner. And then in terms of the mode of teaching and learning before COVID, uh, I think this is not a surprise considering that we have contact universities. Um, all of us basically focused on face-to-face. -face. There was some degree of blended and a small degree of distance. But then during COVID, you'll notice that it shot up from 3.3 to 83.3%. And then there were still some people said, yes, we are taking on a blended uh, approach. And I think one of the things that we, we, we realize is that when we talk about uh, who's doing distance and who's doing blended, I think there is a very relaxed definition of what people consider to be blended. They go, oh, I'm online, therefore I'm blended. D-A. And like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let you work with that definition for now. But the leader was something like, ah, note to self, we're going to have to start defining this. Um, for example, at UJ, at the beginning of this year, we said, oh, we switched to hybrid. But like, oh, hybrid, what is that? Ah, that means that you are now going to lecture to the people in front of you in the classroom, but you must also talk to the people that are here virtually. Hi, everyone, on Zoom. And and, and that's fine, and they, they gave us courses and they said this is how you do it, this is the technology you need to do it. But I think one of the things that they neglected to, to, to realize is I saying it shall be hybrid, off you go, good luck with the rest of the semester, is how many people do you need to successfully hold a hybrid lecture? Now, I would like to think that at least two one to monitor what's going on online, otherwise poor online people. Sorry online people, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just very invested in the physical people in front of me. But that's wrong because it's not about choice. It's the, the people who, for us uh, at UJ, the people who are online have to be online because of capacity constraints. So we had 50% of the class in front of us, but 50% online. And that was considered to be blended. I mean, hybrid. See, even I'm getting at companies. All right. Um, anyway, the other thing about locations for teaching and learning before COVID, 96.7% um, of our participants were on campus. Again, not a surprise because we are, uh, you know, in co we're contact institutions. Uh, but obviously during COVID, 100% said they were online because you're not allowed to go on to campus. Uh, although obviously there were some, there were when, when things eventually relaxed a little, and this was after the survey was taken, uh, there were participants who had to come back because there was lab work to be done, and we would bring people into the laboratory to, to complete the work. There's no amount of uh, virtual dissecting the fish is going to be as satisfying as chopping up a fish in person. Okay, um, apologies to the people who are like, oh, abuse against the, the fish. All right, um, also the one, one, one thing we had uh, that was particularly interesting was um, that we, 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 we were very interested in finding out was how easy was it for our the, the people responding to adapt to the location of teaching and learning. In other words, how easy did they find it to move to online? Um, before and then also during um, COVID. And we can see that actually they didn't, 
so, so, so people did struggle to, to do it online. So you can see there, 36.7% um, said it was very easy, 13 said it was easy, so they said it was okay there. And then during, during the COVID, they said that it, uh, it was 20 and 4, which answered a, a lot more positively. Now, there was still, however, a percentage of people who said no, they struggled with it. And it might be, compared to the overall size, not, not the majority, but still, there were people who, who struggled to do it during um, COVID. And, and the thing is, could we afford to have people struggle, especially during the academics? This is like the blind leading, leading the blind. Imagine your, your, your poor students are sitting there and go, okay, we're struggling. Meanwhile, our lecturer also got kicked off the network. So they, even they cannot go online. I mean, you, you know your students, they, they were joining your classes online and they're like, sorry, ma'am, I got kicked off, bad network. Now you're in the middle of the class, blah, 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 and you get kicked off the network. I suppose, in a way, the students say, oh, you're one of us. But not exactly the best situation to have because it, it causes a lot of panic within the class as well. So what kind of support can we do? Like, like okay, so these, these people are struggling, who do they turn to? And part of our study is with Digital Literature uh, Capital, the idea is, and, and combined with the different other capitals, um, you should be able to tap into the other capitals, so you might not be able to address your digital issues, but you can tap into your other capital in order to solve them. And, and that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to assist you in saying, right, how do we guide you, how do we help you develop your capitals so that you can use it um, to solve your teaching and learning issues overall? Okay, so using um, online resources, I'm not going to go to, um, I'm just going to go through very quickly. Uh, we did look at embodied cultural capital, but that, that was very positive. And um, this one, um, this, this was to do with the other uh, capitals that you did have. And for example, did you visit an art exhibition? So, so the cultural capitals on, that, that you would engage in. And I saw that we weren't that high there prior to COVID and I don't think we, we were during COVID. Um, so so I think what, what this picked up is that we, the people who participated in this um, survey were, weren't as artsy as um, we would have liked. But, but I think it's okay, you know, if you don't want to play, it, it's fine. You don't go visit an art museum, not the end of the world. That's, that's what we think at the Sydney Maybe those questions should be more applicable. Yeah, yes, I think we should have should be, because when we developed the questions, we were like, ah, did you, um, we, we, we read other sources, that, okay, these are the sorts of questions, but yes, as Neil mentioned, we, we should have made it more African. Um, in the institutional culture, um, I'm just going to mention very quickly, so the academics who did participate predominantly did view themselves as doing important work, which I think is very encouraging, because they see it as this is, I'm inspired to do this, this is really important, I need to commit to it. Um, in terms of devices, so our academics who answered did say that they do have devices, they do have a laptop, yeah, that, that's the number one thing, they at least have a laptop, um, and they also might have a smartphone or they have a tablet. And so on average, it was about 1.1-ish um, devices per participant who, who completed the survey. Uh, we also had um, uh, these questions relating to digital capital. Uh, just put the um, entire table here. But ultimately, if we look at the responses, it does look like our uh, participants feel that they do possess digital capital. And um, this is just the devices that they own. And so this, this was the table that summarized the findings of the five different capitals um, that, that uh, people have. Again, uh, mostly positive, but as Sarah said, only 30 people completed. It would be nice if we get more people. But here's the thing, it was an online survey, and now you're asking people 
please complete this. So we exclude, we, 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 we're basically excluding the people. If, if the people didn't have the digital capital, they wouldn't be filling this form in. But uh, this was during lockdown, so um, we, we, we did what we could. Right, um, then in closing, oh, this, this bit, ah, okay. So I, I clearly sent you an older version of the slide. Right, so in, in closing, the idea that what I wanted to say here was that, okay, so for the 30 people who completed this, uh, we do have digital capital. We, we view ourselves as having digital capital. So what next? How do, and, 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 and this is where Sana has to take over, but the idea is let's take that digital capital and develop it further and say, how, let's, let's show everyone how you can use it, what you have ready and turn that into something to, so that we can all work smarter in our teaching and learning, so that we can benefit our students as well. Thank you very much, and I'm not taking way too much time. <laughs> Now you know why we call Grace Lightwire. <laughs> Can you imagine how interesting the class is going to be? <laughs> okay, so I think we have to try to see another 20 minutes. Okay, I'm not going to hold the floor here then. Uh, we might have some questions on the chat based on the previous. Uh, um, just request Connie Okay. So you, you've got a, another colleague who would love to join your classes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to spend just five minutes uh, just as an overview of the, the course on e-learning for lectures, which is available to all UK ZN staff currently. It's a self-paced uh, learning uh, module, which you can complete. Um, I have tried to prompt those of you who have registered to, you know, keep you on track as to where you should have been over the five-week period, but there was no compulsion for you to ensure that you completed the activities during that time. I'm going to start off, and before I play the video, I would like to acknowledge the role of the instructional designers, particularly Sefu at the um, UTLO office for all her assistance and her team's assistance in getting this course up one level in terms of the uh, quality of the, the course which was originally developed. And, and you can see, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have actually registered for that course, but you will find that the activities which are in there are fairly engaging activities which make use of a variety of tools um, and it's, it's meant to be a practical based course where you, you work with the theory which has been taught in that particular activity and then design some part of your module using that theory so that, that, so that the application is happening as you're taking the course itself. So this short video just gives an overview of the course. Hello and welcome to the e-learning for lecturers course. In this five-week online and self-paced course, you will be guided on how to develop creative and interactive digital content, use resources to plan and conduct your blended teaching, and apply these new strategies in your own modules. As a practical resource guide for lecturers at different levels of comfort with digital tools, this course consists of various activities and resources that aim to provide you with the necessary skills to begin or enhance your journey into e-learning. Over the course of the next four weeks, you will be engaging with three distinct topics. 1. Design aspects for blended learning. 2. Creating digital learning material. And 3. How to develop and deliver suitable assessment online. We hope that the content and activities are helpful and look forward to hearing your views as you make your way through the course. So make sure to share your progress with fellow participants as you go. Good luck! And let's get started. Okay, so that was just a very um, quick overview of the, the course itself. And to explain to you, as was highlighted in the video, there are three different units. The first one, which looks at the design aspects of blended learning, and as Grace rightly pointed out, 
we need to firstly understand what blended learning is and what's the difference between blended learning, online learning, and hybrid learning. Okay, then uh, the second unit starts giving you activities uh, which you would use to create your own digital material uh, in a course which you are planning or in a course which you're currently lecturing. So it allows you to apply the concepts which you've learned theoretically into the module itself. And the third unit focuses specifically on assessments. And for each of the assess sorry, for each of the units, you'll find that there's an outline of the learning objectives, then there's an introduction to what that particular unit does. There's learning content and resources, and the learning content and resources which are found are varied types of learning content. So you might have some theory that you need to read. Sometimes there's a video. In some activity, for example, you might be, be directed to another tool, like in activity one of, uh, I think it's learning unit one, where you have to, or learning unit two, you have to, to go to Padlet and create, uh, or take a screenshot of what, what you've done thus far, and then allowing you to engage with other um, participants in the, in the module itself. And then there's a reflective uh, component to each each unit itself. Now the reactive, the reflective forum and the assessment activities currently do not have marks associated with them because we try we try this this role out as a pilot to see how academics feel the course is. We're open to suggestions on how we can improve the course and then in the future iterations of the course we will then um, you know, embed some sort of assessment where there's a grading in and possibly a certification at the end of the, the course itself. So just to give you a, a bit of an idea of the look and feel of the course, this is what you would see when you, you log in for the first time. You have to complete the activities sequentially, so you cannot move to, a, to the next activity until you've completed the previous activity. Here's an example of activity one, which you have in, in one of the units. Um, and it, it just gives you an introduction, the instructions of what you need to do, how you need to go about it, and there's a link for every uh, aspect of the activity itself. So here's the example where you are asked to design or put a screenshot of the design of your particular that, that particular aspect of your module where you have implemented what you've learned during that activity to post it up onto a, a tablet and then uh, you can you can get feedback from other colleagues who are also taking the same course. Uh, I'm I'm not going to go to the the actual model course because I think you have enough time to be able to engage with that. But just to let you know where we're heading at from here is we're hoping that once academics complete this course, so we have you know, a group of academics who completed the course online, we want to be able to schedule either focus groups or individual interviews so that we can get your feedback on the intervention which we've implemented and then to see whether that intervention has actually helped you to improve your digital fluency if you, you initially were not that fluent. Um, also to take your suggestions on how we can improve the course. And then we also want to try to adapt this course for students to be able to take to improve their digital fluency. So currently this is designed for academics. The next level will then be to target the students' digital fluency and to get your feedback on how we can achieve that as well. So in the next few months, I'm sure that our team will be contacting you if you've completed the course to see how we can engage with you better. And this will help us to, to develop the framework which we're hoping to, do, to deliver at the end of this project. So I will stop there to allow for some engagement. And before we, we um, open it up to the audience who's here face to face, uh, can we um, just engage with the Zoom participants. So I'm going to stop my screen share. And for the participants who are online on Zoom, if you'd like to uh, unmute or uh, even switch your videos on, we would welcome your participation. Uh, just to let us know if you have any queries or anything you'd like to contribute to what we have just spoken about in the presentation itself today. 
check. Nothing will check. So we have a few. Let me just see. Okay, I, I might just, just call out, uh, I think I'll some names in this Zoom session, uh, like uh, Sherry. Um, Sherry, if you're here, or Andisha, watching people who I know, uh, anything that you'd like to share with us about the session, and then we'll get to the face-to-face -face audience. Okay, I think everybody's too shy <laughs> to, to unmute and speak like our students are in the classroom, so we'll move to our face-to-face -face audience. Is shy. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I enjoy it because I don't want to be shy. <laughs> Hi everyone, I hope you're well. Um, I can thank you for the session. I must say it's been an, an interesting one, especially to have the insights. Yes. Yeah, we can use the mic then. I was looking at Yeah, and then the Zoom guys, my coach, because I don't want to go for the guys here. Yeah. Sorry about that, Zoom colleagues. <laughs> Um, so I was just saying that thank you for the session to, to the organizers. Um, very interested to have insights from, from a small sample that has responded to a survey. And I fully agree, I think survey fatigue is real. And it, it compromises the type of research that we're trying to do because we don't, don't get uh, what we're hoping to achieve in this research project. Um, I think uh, Prof Grace, I found it very interesting that feedback from students who drop out uh, as far as the work working far too much. And he made me ask myself, are we making the workload too much or are the students entering, is it the type of students that are entering university that can't handle the amount of work? I think more engagement needs to happen there. Whether reflection on an individual aspect, but also I think as academics we need to reflect on that because we, we don't want them to drop out before they need to. And then the other one was um, on the feedback on the ease of moving to online and most finding it difficult. And I was just thinking, is it possibly because most of the respondents are senior, maybe not as much tech savvy, even though I know training happened, but were people really engaging with the training as hoped for by the institutions or was it a matter of I'm locked in, yes I'm in the workshop because I know personally with at that time there was so much going on, there was so much to still prepare and do, you would sit in a workshop but do multitasking and you would be fully engaged with that training. So those are the things that were lighting up in my head, are those other contributing factors that may have been there and hence the difficulty to shift. And now we're facing a new animal. Now we need to shift sort of back, not fully to the normal that we were used to, but it's another new normal because now we're incorporating what we developed during COVID. And yeah, so it's, it's just always shifting. And I think that's another layer to be looked at as well. We keep shifting, 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 and I think we won't stop in the next few years. Yeah. Thanks, that's what I wanted to share. Uh, thank you. I think one of the things that I picked up, uh, so I, I really became vice dean uh, for my faculty last year, October. Uh, one of the things I've, I've learned to do recently is uh, speak to the students directly. Uh, because when you get problems reported to you, you, you obviously speak to the academics. And the academics will tell you this is why we think the students are struggling. Then you speak to the students and you ask them, why are you struggling? And then those that come forward, it turns out that what the students say and what the academics think are two, are two different viewpoints. So, I, and, and that's why I think we also need to look, we need to do research. We, because academics have certain notions of what they think is, the, is, is going on. And it then comes as a surprise to them that actually that's not the most the students are saying. Uh, on the other hand, you also get academics who get rather defensive, and I, I, I'm saying this in, in general, not, not just at my institution. And that is, um, we, and I think you also encountered this. You go, so, so you go to an academic and say, listen, the following complaint is, 
being lodged. And then they will say, oh no, but you know, sometimes students are very clever. They will try and play you against another academic. So, so they get a defensive line and then they try to come up with a, with a plausible reason as to why this, this is the case. And, and I think uh, what I'm trying to get at is, by giving you this response, I'm saying, number one, we don't necessarily know our students the way we do, and that's why research is now so important. We actually have to go and study more and, and learn more, because what we think, it, it might be true, but let, let's confirm it. Because the students that you have now are not the same students before lockdown. But, but maybe, you know, before lockdown, you were used to a certain type of student group, and they did things a certain way. And so you're probably bringing that back, because you go, oh, we're back to face-to-face -to -face again. Um, it's probably the same group of students, you know, the same student reasons and so on. But as I've mentioned, they, they had two years online at high school or at first year. So, so for us, we said, even our third years this year, they're babies, they're new, they haven't, been, they haven't stepped foot onto campus. And, and I think it, it's really important we, 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 we rewrite what we understand, what we think of students. So you say, uh, are we, we, we do need to look at how we engage with our students. Because um, the, another possibility is that, say, Neil, Neil goes, ah, I'm going to try and engage with my students by adding all these extra activities. And I go, ah, I also want to do that. Now, we aren't all teaching. We, what the unfortunate reality is we're all teaching our students in isolation. And our students, actually have to accommodate all of us. And I like to say, and, and you know this, this you know, they say you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Why aren't we taking that kind of attitude in our, in our, in our environment? We should see it as Neil has a role to play, Sana has a role to play, I have a role, but we should speak to each other and say, what are you doing? Okay, you're trying that. If all of us try the same thing, if we all overwhelm our students with all this work, are we going to end up giving them so much work that they end up resigning, well, quitting the, the program? You know, so I think there's, there's also the need for us to collaborate more, more effectively. And then Neil wants to say, stop. <laughs> stop. Yeah, I'd like to, to chip in there and say that um, not necessarily stuff, but an observation during COVID, a lot of our students were working and studying at the same time, you know, and um, this overwhelming work responsibility might not have just been academic, it could have been, you know, I saw one of our students at the garage uh, filling up petrol, I said, what are you doing? No, he's, he's working, you know, the family needs it. So, I think there's aspects of COVID that we don't fully understand. So we don't fully understand the environment our students were in and how they were learning. Another very important uh, stat that we can look at is the success rate of UNISA, distance learning. Um, they've got a terrible throughput rate in distance learning. So if you look at how our students prefer to learn as socially constructing meeting, in a class together with interactions, and you put them alone on a, in front of a computer and it's totally foreign and it uh, doesn't work. So when we're developing these digital artifacts, bear that in mind and use tools that uh, bring the students together in the learning. Don't keep them apart. Thank you. Also, I just want to add to that um, statement which uh, Grace made earlier about the workloads uh, and uh, sorry the statement which you made about workload and which Grace spoke about where we need to talk to each other. Just a simple example here at UKZ and we moved to continuous assessment um, during the, the early stages of COVID and I think we're still doing continuous assessment currently. But if, if you just take an example of a single discipline Moving to continuous assessment meant that we need to have a number of smaller assessments for every module. So if a student had to take four modules for a semester, in every module that they were taking, instead of having the typical three assessments or two assessments which they had plus an exam, they were now having six or seven different assessments throughout the semester. 
And there were some academics who were so eager to do continuous assessment uh, and give them assessments that they were giving them quizzes on Moodle every week, you know, that kind of thing. And then in that discipline itself, if your students were, for example, I'm going to take my own discipline, uh, just as an example, I'm not saying this was happening, but if, if, if our students, ISMT students, in their third year, for example, they do four third year modules, right? So can you imagine the amount of workload that they would have if they had to have six assessments for all four modules? And then suddenly in one week, they've got four different assessments due, different types of assessments. One is a presentation, one is a written ass assignment, the other is a physical, you know, uh, sorry, an online test. It was, it was really getting too much. And, and the main reason for that is because we were not talking to each other. So even within the discipline, if there's four different modules uh, which the students are taking and you've got four different module coordinators, we need to talk to each other to say, okay, well, this is what I'm planning to do, or this is when I'm having my assessments. Because suddenly you will find in the week of the assessment and all students wait for that week to arrive and not tell you beforehand, they suddenly tell you that I'm overwhelmed. I can't, or we can't meet the deadline for this assignment because we've got this, this, and this. Then you get the class rep uh, emailing you. Then the class rep will email the academic leader because they want to get, you know, a more uh, management support from it. Then the SRC will email you. Instead of the students raising the concerns when they see the module outline uh, and planning out their semester. Likewise, we as academics as well need to engage with each other to try to see ways in which we can reduce that workload for students, reduce the work stress which students have as well. Sorry, I cut you on you wanted to say something. No, it's, uh, I take your point about the workload is a problem. But one thing I noticed about with my students certainly, I mean, I do online practicals and I give them a week to submit. And the reality is that the vast majority wait for those few hours uh, when it's before it's due, which is usually midnight on Sunday, for example, and that would be the day back. And they wait until then. There are very few who will do it in the first uh, couple of days after it becomes open. So I think the big issue is how students plan their time and manage their time. And I mean, I know I have a daughter who's a first year student experiencing this online, and she's in geology. So she has practice as well, three times a week, um, over and above all the others. And it can be heavy, but I mean, I know from watching her, she doesn't manage her time as well. Uh, she was finishing off an essay this morning that had to be handed in um, this morning, and she had to meet with me about what was not. We weren't ready, we were still printing for it. Um, so I think this issue of um, teaching students to manage the time, and I know the first year program, uh, experience program is trying to do that, um, but as senior students, seem to struggle maybe even more than the first year of teaching. Thanks. And I think that's a very key point that we need to, to look at when we're developing the, the, the module for students because part of digital fluency means that you need to be able to use tools to, to plan yourself and to, to be able to manage your time. So that time management aspect is essential and students need to realize why they need to plan. Otherwise, they're going to be feeling the stress itself. There's some views back behind that. We just have a hand on the chair. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'll just take Shelly first. Shelly? Maybe use the one on the other side. Uh, I think we wanted the back door to be a bit. Oh, it's not bad. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not going to expect our students to uh, go from the college. <laughs> Yeah, just another observation which feeds into the whole thing of them feeling overwhelmed. The, the, the whole online uh, experience for students, and I know that, that we, were, we were told in the beginning that the universities were trying not to leave anybody behind. I, I think that there's a, a massive amount of students that have been left behind simply because they're at home. And at home, in many instances, I, can, I can't speak for your um, student body, Grace, but I'm assuming for yours, Neil, and ours. Homes, because most of our students are from Prince Albert to three schools, homes often in, in rural places, then or possibly in other provinces entirely. Homes are a place where 
you know, there isn't that connectivity, or certainly not a stable connectivity. Uh, home's a place where you've got chores to do, family chores, you, you also might be holding down a job, as, as, as somebody, somebody said. Um, and, and, and the effort that, that goes into trying to stay connected online and stay up to date online with, your, with everything that's thrown at you, there's so much worse if you've got to find, I don't know, a, a, a near, nearby center where you can get connectivity at get an a, a, a internet cafe or whatever the case may be, usually at large expense as well, which they don't, they can't afford. Um, we've heard so many stories about Nest plus laptops, Nest plus funded laptops having been sold um, because students, you know, their families need, need the money more. Um, so a lot of them are on their phones yes. and that must make it even more overwhelming. So, you know, it's all very well to, to, to get creative online and, and, and um, all of that, but the, unfortunately I think that a huge proportion of our student body have been left behind in these last three years. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be what it will improve for some if we come back to campus. Uh, but some have lost their, because of this, uh, these three years, they've lost their nest plus funding because they've underperformed due to all of these reasons. So they're not going to be able to come back to campus. They're still going to be stuck at home. And are they ever going to be able to complete their qualification under those conditions? You know, I think we've lost them for, forever. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's been hugely problematic from that point of view. Um, you know, we, we're trying to put our, ourselves in our students' shoes. And in many cases, that position is untenable. It's just not conducive for, for learning or achieving or, achieving or performing at the other way. I, I, I think, you know, if there was a magic wand which we could wear really just to, to put everything right, that would be the only solution. Because as you say, we have different levels of students who we, we've lost along the way, some who have managed to, to progress, and others who will struggle to get there, but they will eventually get that degree. It's, it's about whether they can return to campus when we do eventually come back at UKZN. Um, and it's also about being able to provide them with that support and the infrastructure to be able to complete their studies. If they're not going to get both of them, uh, they're not going to be able to compete it. So as you said, we probably lost it. And that's one of the reasons why also we have the job of rates, which uh, Grace has spoken about different uh, reasons at UJ, but at, at UKZN, our reasons are, are, are most economical, they are more, you know, economic reasons, they are more infrastructure reasons. That and support reasons, lack of support that they, they couldn't actually meet the view, so that's why they dropped out. Right, let me say some more stuff. <laughs> Business intelligence, right? tracking real time data on our students' well being, uh, their financial situations, uh, their mental well being. For many of them, it was traumatic losing uh, people during COVID, which was a, a, you know, something else that we don't consider. Um, so business intelligence requires us to use those digital currencies, not only in the classroom, but in the administration of our, of our institutions. So if you, for instance, have um, a class that is relying on transport and it's at 7.30 in the morning, and the majority of the class on it, don't attend all the time, you know, it should be red flagged and moved to a convenient time for the students. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, and, and the background, the HEMIS information that we get from the DHET, how much of that do we use to understand our students and where they come from and, and, and what their issues are before they even start the learning process? How can we support our students um, and make it a more positive experience. Um, Decolonising the curriculum is part of that, that, that effort. Make them more comfortable in higher education. Don't, feel, don't let them feel alienated by coming to, to, to a campus that is totally foreign in terms of learning and teaching and learning. So I think all of those things feed into the business intelligence. And then we've got PowerHeater that is a, a very powerful database that we use 
for reporting, not for supporting. So reports without support for me is a waste of time. It's just to tick the boxes. Thank you. It's about knowing who our students are at the end of the day. Um, okay, we're going to move to the virtual audience.